So it's a great pleasure to welcome to our 2020 online Trend Summit, one of the hottest chefs in London right now, to share with us her passion for plant-based cooking, for seasonality, local sourcing and sustainability, as well as her motivations for her new hyper-seasonal pop-up. Chantal Nicholson, welcome to the Food People 2020 online Trend Summit. It's great to have you here today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Can you can we just start by I mean setting this, this the scene for us? Where are you? Where are you speaking to us from? Yeah, what's the what's the day job? <laughs> okay, so I am actually at my new pop up, which is called uh -huh. All's Well uh, uh -huh. in Hackney. We opened uh, just over two weeks ago, just under two mm -hmm. weeks ago, actually. So we had about five days of no six days of serv five days of service before yeah. our tier four kicked in. Yeah. Um, so we are opening tomorrow as a shop and takeaway and okay. doing deliveries from here as well. Um, okay. Being a, it's a neighborhood community. So I think hopefully things will go quite well here. Uh, and I assume with a plan to switch back into um, service as normal once early December. Is that is that the plan? Fingers are crossed that it will be early December. Yes. Indeed. Certainly mine are. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just building on that then, thinking about, um, and it might be that you want to think about both Treadwells and also uh, All's Well, but can you just describe for us a bit about um, your kind of food food philosophy, your food agenda in those kind of two, those two locations? Just kind of bring that to life for us a little bit. Sure. I think for me, um, one of my biggest passions is, is vegetables. Um, I think that stems from growing up in New Zealand, where I was surrounded by beautiful, delicious produce, and it was just part and parcel of, of of my life really of my childhood yeah. and it's only in, on reflection that I kind of see how privileged I was to have that upbringing so they've always been a passion of mine I think I've become more passionate about them probably in the last three to four years mm -hmm. and both Treadwells and Allswell the menu is probably about 60 to 70 percent plant-based mm -hmm. um, I'm very cautious careful to use the term plant-based rather than vegan yeah because to me veganism is a lifestyle choice whereas plant-based talks about what's on the plate and yeah. I'm not plant-based myself, but I feel that obviously we all need to eat a lot more plants, both for the planetary health and for our own health, for biodiversity, all that sort of good stuff moving forward. So very veg-centric, I would say, both restaurants. Try and source as locally as possible. I have two deliveries a week that come in from small organic biodynamic farmers in Kent. So really, and the, the produce just tastes, you can taste the difference. It's a lot more expensive, but it, you can actually taste the difference. Um, very much a, lo a philosophy on zero waste and trying to use up as much as possible and trying to also, I guess, yeah, cook as sustainably as possible and actually run a restaurant as sustainably as possible. And how do those, how do those things particularly around sourcing and you talked about zero waste there, how does that actually impact on what you do kind of day to day because that's that's it's a positive choice but it's not an easy choice so, no yeah. yeah i would agree it does kind of it can add a few more layers into into a workload um i think you know traditionally and the way i used to work was you'd kind of you'd devise your menu and then you would order anything for that menu and yes it was seasonal but it wasn't kind of i guess hyper seasonal which is the way i like to work now where possible it was very much about okay i want to put this dish on the menu because these things are in season at that point in time. Now it's slightly working the opposite way around and saying, actually, what can I get from my suppliers? What's on this list that I get twice a week? How can I then integrate that into a dish to put on the menu? So it's somewhat working backwards. Yeah. Obviously, some of the staples are still um, around and, and you know some things aren't necessarily seasonal. You've just got butter and oil. Try to use as much British produce as possible, but there are, I do make a few exceptions um, for things like olive oil and citrus as well. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you say you kind of work backwards, um, that that really brings to life, certainly for me, the, the difference between seasonal and hyper-seasonal, but does that, how does that kind of integrate Yeah, with what you do? Have you got kind of conversations going on with farmers and growers that, you know, keep that, conversation going continually so you you know what, what what's available i mean years ago when i was a when i was a chef it was about ordering off a list so how does mm. that how is that different in the way that you work so i think i've always i'm kind of aware of, of when things should be about to come into season yeah. and i think that dialogue with 
especially now that I have with the farmers, is finding out what actually is, what do they have. And I get sent a list twice a week of what actually is in the fields to harvest. Yeah. And then order off that list, it gets harvested and then it comes to me literally the next day. So everything is, you know, uber fresh as well as being completely um, local, sustainable, growing in a really great way. I also try, I also speak to them about what is, if there's anything that's kind of surplus or potentially going to waste. Um, so I had a, a kind of massive crate of wonky cucumbers um, just last week, actually. And obviously going to preserve those to be able to use moving forward. So trying to really support the farmers as well as you know, ordering what I need. It's also saying, well, actually, what do you have that could yeah. I could potentially use that surplus that potentially may kind of go to waste or to ground cover. And have you have you sort of embarked on any projects with any growers to you know perhaps bring back or to feature any uh, heritage uh, varieties or bring back anything from the past or even to try and preserve something that you know maybe you know isn't grown so much? Is are those conversations that you're having as well? They're definitely in the early stages, and I think it's very much about what's possible and what's feasible because I think that generally differs from kind of I guess site to site and also what the farmer is, yeah. is interested in and yeah. what's possible so I think we yeah. also work with I also work with a farm uh, in Wiltshire where I get my lamb from it's pasture fed organic lamb I've been to visit them they're great people and I just feel really for me that's the kind of meat I want to buy obviously we don't have a huge amount of meat on the menu but everything I do have I want it to be the best in terms of where it comes from, how it's sourced, how it's yeah. reared, um, and then how it also gets to me as well. How do you kind of, I suppose, tread that line between, we talked about being plant centric. How do you, you know, what kind of gauge or measure do you use? Because is, is meat used as more of a garnish or is it, yeah, how do you, use, when you do use meat, how do you use it, um, yeah, on the, on the plate? What's your, kind of approach to that i guess for me it's, it's using it's either using cuts of meat that aren't particularly popular necessarily mm -hmm. um which yeah. means that then there is a surplus of that meat so if i can then take it off the off the farmer's hand so i've got lamb ribs um, mm -hmm. on the menu here nice. and then we use all the trim from that to make a toasty so it, it, again oh, it's wow. kind of using that 360 we render the fat down, which we fry the toasties in. So mm. it's that 360 way of actually working. And obviously any fish is sustainable as well, mm -hmm. yeah. which does limit it quite considerably. Um, but for me, that's that's important that we, we function in that way. And so for me, it, it kind of depends on the dish, really, um, as to whether it's kind of the hero, whether it's a garnish. I think for me, meat dishes are generally, I guess, meaty. That makes sense rather than using meat in vegetable dishes. Because for me, if people want yeah. a purely kind of vegetable dish, they'll get something that's plant-based. So then yeah. anything meaty is a bit more, is a bit more meaty. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you talked about sort of very much being inspired by your, your, your childhood and growing up in New Zealand. Are there any particular moments or stories or occasions where you, it really sticks in your mind to say, yeah, now on reflection, that was something that I've you know, taken inspiration from. Can you call on anything if, like that? Yeah, I mean, there's probably loads. I had, we always had a, you know, a garden when I was growing up, a vegetable garden. So we would literally, walk, you know, pop out to the garden before dinner and snip off some salad leaves or pull some carrots up, dig some potatoes. Um, all my extended family were hugely into to gardening and I had an aunt and uncle that had a stone fruit orchard in central Otago, which is a really yeah. beautiful part of the world, um, yeah. now famous for wine growing. Indeed. And my uncle used to wear these, you know, kind of farm blue overalls, and he obviously rode a motorbike, so he'd kind of, you'd hear him pulling up at the end of the day, and he'd come in with these bulging pockets um, of all these new varieties of things that he was growing. Amazing. And it just, you know, the flavour, I think, I feel a bit sorry for people that haven't had one of his apricots, because... The apricots that you can buy in the UK just there's they're just chalk and cheese, and so if that's someone's experience of an apricot, it was this kind of squash ball sour little thing. It's not a true representation of how good they can be. And actually, eating fruit, you know, directly off the tree, kind of sun warmed, is just you know kind of a very very different experience. And is that your I guess is that your reference point then when you're sourcing when you're working with farmers now in your your two locations that you're yeah 
striving to you know, to try and get that and then deliver that to um, a paying customer. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, it's, you know, he, my uncle used to grow just the flavors of his vegetables were insane. I've never had a potato like his and we would literally dig them up just before dinner, just wash them and, and boil them. And they were just so delicious. And for me, it's about enhancing that flavor. So I've got a carrot dish on the menu here at Allswell and it's a wonky carrot that I get from Kent. And mm -hmm. it probably is about three, four, four times the price of the ones that I would get, which we call donkey carrots. Mm -hmm. um, so I assume they're for donkeys. So, <laughs> but the flavor is, is insane. And I think that's, you know, for me, I'm willing to, to pay that extra money because the flavor is, it's what a carrot should taste like. And all I need to kind of do is, you know, roast it at a really high heat and it just has this most insane sweetness and people are kind of blown away by the fact that it's just a carrot. But I think that's, yeah. you know, we've kind of lost sight of vegetables actually tasting like they're supposed to taste and, and obviously yields kind of taken over in a lot of, um, you know, instances. So we've kind of lost the ability to really have that flavor. And I think people have kind of, I guess, rekindled it with meat. And in the last probably kind of 10 years of that really great quality meat and you can actually taste the difference. Whereas I think we've still got a way to go with vegetables. What, what in your view are the kind of building blocks, I suppose, because you're speaking so passionately there about the, the, the flavor of that carrot. Going back, what, what are the things for you that, that make that difference in flavor is it you know is it is it the soil is it the variety is it what what are those kind of building blocks in your view as a as a as a cook as a chef i mean as a chef obviously i'm not a, a kind of um agro tech no no i know you're not an <laughs> <Fine. But laughs> I, um, for me i think the soil has a huge huge part to play in it and i think also the fact that it's it's kind of left to grow in its own environment rather than being forced at yeah. speed to grow so it loses out um on that kind of flavor because it hasn't had that time to develop and grow it's kind of grown really quickly and it doesn't have a chance to develop that flavor that's kind of my humble opinion yeah. and obviously i'm sure there's a lot more science involved in it but yeah. you know we've seen recently that soil health is is key and i think that the crop rotation and biodiversity is also hugely important and it's about, I guess, you know, these farms, that's where it's obviously they're doing something right because the flavour is is very noticeably different. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Do you, do you think that this style of cooking, plant-centric, plant-biased, do you think it has a an even greater relevance in this, um, not so much lockdown, but this sort of broader era of... Um, it's a pandemic era that we're in and are going to, you know, despite vaccines and so on, are going to be in for, you know, quite mm. some time. Do you think it has a greater relevance today than perhaps it did? I would hope so. I, I would hope that people value food a lot more than they did six months ago because when yeah. they couldn't get it in the first lockdown, yeah. um, I think there was a greater value placed on it. And I was really, I guess, inspired and, and happy to see that kind of the ancient grain suppliers like Codme Dodds, the people that grow amazing wheat to make flour with Gilchester's, they were absolutely kind of sold out on a, on a weekly basis. And for me, that yeah. kind of gave a little bit of hope that those yeah. things were being, I used rediscovered and also being valued for the fact that they could bring something really great to the table versus, you know, what was available in supermarkets or, or online. I think it, it really did show a difference in that. So I do hope that that continues. I think also from a cost perspective, vegetables are cheaper. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're cheaper than meat. So if you can have kind of five veggie based meals a week, you know, and two meat based, you will, you know, you will see the difference. And I think all of us probably a little, a little bit more conscious of, of costs and, you know, yeah. inputs and outputs right now. So I think that also can um, pave a way for an opportunity to, to, for veg to be a bit more, um, to feature better in people's, people's diets at home. Yeah. And cost is obviously one motivation, whether that be uh, as, a, as a home cook or indeed working in in industry. What for you are the other motivations? We've talked about um, your childhood experiences. Cost is clearly another one. Um, what are those other kind of motivations for you that push you more towards plant based um, cooking? I think for me, I also, I, I love vegetables. I literally do love them. So I think that's probably easy for me to actually want to eat a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think also looking at a bigger picture, it is, you know, planetary health. 
I think looking at biodiversity of crops yeah. is also really important. Championing things that used to be kind of championed years ago. You know, I feel like we've come, I've come a bit full circle myself as well, looking at things that my grandmothers both used to do and finding myself doing them now and thinking that's so ironic that when I was little, I kind of thought, why is she doing that? Like, why is she rinsing her plastic bags? And why is she saving all her vegetable scraps? And now that's exactly what I do. So it's kind of ironic that it's come full circle. And I think that, you know, in terms of actually looking at that 360, it is that whole approach. It's, you know, minimizing the single use plastics. It's, it's maximizing how we use things. It's minimizing waste in any way, shape or form. And I guess in that sense, to look at it in a broader perspective, it's almost moving, you know, it's that, it's that notion of a circular economy, reusing, repurposing, you know, yeah. as little waste as possible. And, you know, that's where we need to be going to be able to sustain you know, a planet moving forward, really. Yeah, abs no, absolutely. Do you feel that cooking with plants um, gives you a, a greater or different canvas for creativity compared to a, a, a world? And I, and I ask this because I've talked to many chefs about this in, in, in the past, and, and there's, there's definitely a theme, a theme to the answer. And I'm really curious from your um, point of view about the does that does it give you a greater freedom perhaps? than um, some of the, the rules and formalities around um, cooking when you've got uh, um, meat as being the, the centre point of a, of a particular dish? Um, I think it gives a huge amount of scope. Um, some people may not see that as freedom <laughs> um, yeah. because people that are kind of inherently focused on, on meat, I think sometimes it's difficult for them to, to kind of see past that at times and to see something else that could be the hero of the dish. But I think if you look at how many, even just from a functional uh, kind of practical perspective, you know, there's kind of a finite amount of different types of meat, really, and it's much smaller than yeah, than cool. plants. You know, if you're looking at grains, if you're looking at everything from that, it, it's kind of probably, I mean, I wouldn't even hazard a guess, but, you know, kind of five times the amount of things that you have to start with. Um, yeah. And I think there's also, you know, meat can be, quite restrictive it can be quite tricky obviously it's mm -hmm. you know expensive to experiment with in a kitchen if something yeah. goes wrong it's quite hard to then you know you can't really fix it it's kind of that's it if you've overcooked a steak then that's you can't you yeah. can't under re you know it's gone <laughs> exactly so i think vegetables can be a little bit more forgiving they're also sometimes a bit quicker to cook so i think you get a bit more scope during service to do things mm -hmm. um to order or a la menu i think it's yeah, there is a huge, huge scope with them. And I think for me, I feel more comfortable with vegetables as well because I, I know them better. I've kind of, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've worked with them a long time of my life. Whereas if you look at kind of quite, um, you know, niche or special meat that maybe you've only cooked kind of a handful of times, yeah. you're not quite as in control of that as you would be with, for instance, a carrot or a cauliflower that's been something that's yeah. been with you your whole life and that you can experiment with because you know, it kind of costs you two pounds, not not twenty two pounds. So yeah. I think yeah. there's a huge amount more scope, personally. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really exciting. What what would your advice be for either a chef or indeed a home cook looking to shift towards more of a plant based diet, um, thinking beyond some of the, the the barriers? What would your advice be to them? I think one of the not eras, but I think. I think the approach needs to be the same approach that you would take with meat. That mm -hmm. would be my kind of advice as someone that, that cooks, you know, with both. And I think that's what people have commented on when they have eaten in the plant-based dishes at the restaurants is, I guess, the depth of flavour. And you can get a depth of flavour with a vegetable. You just need to approach it in the same way that you would a piece of meat. And I always give the analogy that you wouldn't steam a steak and eat it because it would be revolting. Yeah, yeah, I think nothing of steaming cauliflower or broccoli and, and eating it or even expecting children to eat it when there's yeah. actually Indeed. kind of pretty much not a huge amount of pleasure in eating that. So I think those, you know, that high heat, caramelization, char grilling, yeah. approaching approaching it in the same way that you would if it was, you know, a, a piece of meat or fish is a good way to start to, I guess, think differently about, about vegetables. Yeah. So boiling and steaming off the... <laughs> Off the t off the techniques list, but yeah, think of this. Yeah, some of the things, perhaps even barbecuing and fire cooking yeah. and those types of things as well. I guess, yeah, absolutely. What um, would your sort of hope 
for the future be you know thinking about how consumers and chefs in and the wider industry uh, adopt the shift towards plant-based what do you hope that future horizon brings i think for me it's about i would never want kind of meat to be eradicated because i think it, there's a huge amount of of culture and a huge amount of livelihood involved yeah. in it and you know it is it is delicious let's, let's face it so i think just moving to a shift where it's, it's kind of seen as a treat versus a, a kind of every day i think the removal mm -hmm. of factory farms of you know kind of really poor animal welfare needs to yeah. needs to go so and i think for me the true cost of food is paid as well because i think a lot of food is too cheap um yeah. and you know food that is not particularly nutritious or not particularly well um grown or produced is too cheap um so i think it's about actually the things that are really important you know kind of more of a plant-based in terms of whole foods is yeah. is really kind of championed and, and taken on board and farmers are given you know there's a huge amount of work in you know all sorts of farming both types and i think it's really important that that is recognized and valued because otherwise it's we're kind of going to lose it in, in some yeah. respects so i think yeah my hope is that it is vegetables are really appreciated and the kind of work that goes into them and getting them you know, to the store or that all of your plate is valued and that we can also get to a point where you know we are actually slowing down on the you know the kind of destruction that we're doing obviously it's going to take a long time to be able to reverse it but i think just to slow it down is is where we need to get to and I suppose, and you've started to touch on it there. Actually, what what would be what would be your fear if we if if we don't as a as a consuming food consuming um, public? What's your fear if we don't do that? I think we'll lose the you know we've already lost a huge amount of biodiversity. We'll use the, we'll lose the range of of produce that we can actually mm -hmm. we can is it actually available to us. So there'll be a lot of things that you know we potentially enjoy now that we won't be able to in kind of five or ten years potentially which would yeah. be a huge loss. And also that, yeah, things would just kind of become to a point that actually, you know, it could be dangerous for us to even go outside. It could be all sorts of things that actually, I think our yeah. quality of life could be just completely diminished yeah. um, pretty rapidly and these things change. And do you, do you feel that there is a, a sea change, that there is a, a shift and a momentum building um, behind to, behind this now compared to perhaps when you were starting to move this way, say three or four years ago? What? Yeah, I think, think there's there definitely, a yeah, there's definitely a lot more chat about it. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of actual facts, I think, I don't know, I mean, COVID kind of went one way and then went the other way, I think, in terms yeah. of actually improving things. So. I think there is there is a lot of chat and people are a lot more conscious about it whether that actually translates into action i'm not mm -hmm. entirely sure but i do hope that that momentum will will carry it all forward and, and we'll keep on a we'll get onto more of a positive trajectory moving forward i guess part of the momentum for you is where you're sitting now which is uh all's well can you uh, versus treadwells can you just tell us a bit more about all's well and uh, and what's that that pop-up is all about and what you're trying to achieve sure so i guess the impetus came from um obviously treadwells is based in Covent garden so we've had kind of a triple whammy effect of, of no tourists no theater goers and no office yeah. workers yeah. also no shoppers so it kind of became a, a bit of a ghost town and for me it was a pretty kind of tough thing to realize and also to experience because you know i had a team of people that were really willing and able to work but actually the work wasn't there yeah and i think for me you know the creative side of having a restaurant and, and functioning a living breathing thing was becoming was was diminishing so we had an idea that actually you know neighborhoods for me it was like neighborhoods are the place to be because actually people are there is a community people are staying within their neighborhood they're going out yeah. they're enjoying they're supporting um and so it was more a case of well actually how can we be part of a neighborhood you know really quickly yeah. um and you know we found the site i think we looked the other day it was about two months ago just over two months ago um and it was kind of a i kind of hummed and hard a bit as to as to whether or not to do it and you know what was i guess what was the risk yeah um and whilst there was a risk from a from a business financial sense for me the risk of not doing it was greater because yeah. you know just emotionally 
it was something that could get us all thinking positively. It also meant that, the, you know, the, I could kind of split the team in half. So so there was enough work for the guys in Covent Garden. There was enough work for people here in Hackney. Yeah. So it kind of made sense. And I did think, you know, I had in the back of my mind that another lockdown may happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought, well, actually, in this location, you know, there's potential for it to, to be able to, I guess, that dreaded word, pivot um, yeah. into a shop, Indeed. takeaway, delivery. So we start that tomorrow. Um, so for me, it was kind of, you know, as a temporary thing, it's a six month, it's a six month lease. So the risk was pretty minimal. A lot of stuff was here. Yeah. We got a lot, we spent a lot of time on eBay and Gumtree, yeah. Facebook marketplace, um, and got a lot of stuff pre, you know, secondhand. So yeah. financially it was a lot, um, better, but also for me in terms of what I wanted to achieve in principle was the fact that we didn't really need to get anything new. We could repurpose, yeah. um, things. So, we got the keys on the 19th of October and we opened 10 days later to the public. So it was a bit of a, a sprint to the finish, but Absolutely. I think it was something that gave us all, it gave us all something, you know, positive to think about, which at that time, you know, I certainly needed hugely. And I think for me, it's, I guess it's kind of become a bit full circle because I'm actually, you know, back in the kitchen in a very small kitchen yeah. cooking. Yeah. So I've kind of come <laughs> back to the reason I got into this industry in the first place, which was my love, you know, my passion for cooking and food. So in a way, it's kind of brought me full circle um, to my own kind of circular economy in some senses. And I think it's been great. It's given other people, you know, within the team, a different perspective, a different opportunity. It's allowed, it's created a really, a real, a real, um, I guess that team spirit that was kind of wavering when you're all not yeah. there together all the time. So it's, it's yeah. really created something positive and hopefully we can just keep it going throughout this this lockdown to be able to kind of cover the costs to be able to yeah. keep going and serve our takeaways and, and everything else. And do you already feel a sense of um, being closer to a community in this location? I appreciate you haven't been there very long, but I've spoken to quite a few chefs over the last few months and there's a common theme, I think, about connecting with um, the immediate locality and those that are in it and live and work within it as opposed to i mean you made the analogy yourself about covent garden where mm. there's, there's perhaps more of course you have a local clientele as well but there's perhaps more transiency this kind of connection with local community does that resonate with you hugely and that's the reason why I also you know for me i was at the beginning pre-covid i was wanting to get into more of a community yeah. um and i think you know if you look at the neighborhood here versus the neighborhood in Covent Garden. I mean, there isn't really a community in Covent Garden yeah. because, you know, the residents are minimal. There's no kind of, um, yeah, that sense of neighborhood is, yeah. it's there from, I guess, a, more of a commercial perspective, but in terms yeah. of an actual, you know, people to people. And I think we've already found it, you know, really refreshing being in an area that, you know, we know our neighbors, they, they come and talk to us. We, yeah. you know, people came and wished us well on our first day. Nice. And it was, it was just yeah. really that sense of actually, this is kind of the reason why restaurants should exist is that yeah. to be able to you know be that neighborhood spot that people can come to that they can enjoy that you know we get to know their names yeah. all those kind of things again that full circle of what what places like this used to be i guess yeah well you can tell just by the way you're talking about it and your level of excitement and i'm sure that's shared by the local residents and your team as well it's really really exciting and uh, we all everybody that's watching and all of us at the food people wish you all the you know the best of luck with that we hope it goes really well and that uh, launch of delivery goes really well tomorrow on the, over your left shoulder you've got your your uh, book there uh, planted Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that and what that is all about Sure. So that was actually um, published, gosh, over two years ago now. Yeah. It is plant-based. Um, it actually stemmed from, I mean, I guess I wrote it probably four years ago now, started yeah. writing it three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of before this big explosion of, of plant-based food. And for me, I wrote it because I wanted to cook more plant-based food um, in the restaurant. But when I actually looked for resources in terms of recipe books, etc., I found it really hard to find books that were written, I guess, mm -hmm. by people that had, you know, a bit of experience. There were a lot of, um, I guess, domestic books out there, which were, um, yeah, some of them were a little bit questionable in, in terms of what recipes they offered. So for me, I thought, well, if I can create something that, you know, I'm writing all these, I'm creating all these recipes, developing all these recipes for myself, actually, if I can share those and create a resource yeah. for everybody else, then hopefully that will, will help others as well. 
No, brilliant. And one last question. You've talked passionately about carrots and cauliflower. What's the what's the um, vegetable of the or the plant of the moment that you're getting super excited about? So I think probably Brussels sprouts. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> of course. You know, they're kind of a, a, a Marmite thing, aren't they? You love them or you hate them. Yeah, I love um, them. But we've got deep fried Brussels sprouts on the menu here, mm -hmm. with it, which I spray with a, this delicious vermouth vinegar. And Ooh. it's kind of converted those people that don't like sprouts <laughs> into sprout lovers. So we are doing those as a takeaway from tomorrow. So you can come and get a nice little hot box of crispy sprouts um, to amazing. take away. Yeah, that they're, they're super delicious. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, Chantel, thank you so much for that insight uh, into your uh, personal and professional motivations behind plant-based cooking, seasonality, local sourcing and sustainability. Once again, a great, great pleasure to welcome you as a speaker to our 2020 uh, online trend summit in a new format uh, this year. Thanks again, Chantel, on behalf of everyone that's watching and all of us at The Peep People. Thanks for joining thanks. us. Thanks for having me.